Welcome to Real Estate Resource. Thanks for stopping by. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you'll know when new videos are available. I really hope you enjoy this one. Okay, so the NAR lawsuit settlement, I know that um, it uh, probably wasn't something that a lot of people were expecting and i know that us as realtors generally don't deal really well with change um and i know that there's a lot of you know talking heads out there and things that are happening on social media and you're going to see both sides about how this is going to kill real estate and how this is good for it. you're going to see all kinds of stuff but instead what i wanted to do today is just kind of present to you the facts of the settlement give you an overview of that and then give us some ideas some best practices and things that we can start doing now to get prepared okay so i did uh block you guys from being able to unmute because i thought maybe what we could do is i don't think this is going to take us quite the whole hour it maybe will but what i'd like to do is maybe save questions for the very end um so you're not muted but if there, i mean you won't be able to unmute but if there is something pressing, you can just go ahead and type that in the um, chat because I'll see that and then I'll try to answer the questions that way. Otherwise, I'll, I'll allow you guys to unmute towards the end of the, um, of the uh, meeting so that you could ask any questions that you might have. So with that, let me go ahead and share my screen. All right, so right now what you guys should be seeing is uh, the title screen for the little uh, presentation that I put together. So we're going to look through the proposed NAR settlement. And remember, this is a proposed settlement. This isn't finalized yet. So the stuff that we're talking about could kind of change, could be some tweaks before it goes into, into effect. They think mid-July. So sometime this summer is when these things are going to go into effect 100%. So keep in mind, could be some changes or it may not get approved. We don't know. So, but this is what we do know at the moment, and we're going to work within that and try to get you guys prepared. So maybe you feel a little bit more comfortable about the changes, at least prepared and, and uh, knowledgeable. All right, so let's look. Proposed NAR settlement, the highlights. NAR is going to pay $418 million over the course of four years. So they're not paying all of it next, you know, when this thing gets approved. They're going to pay it over the next four years. So in, in, small, in small pieces, well, not so small at $418 million, but they're going to pay that out over the course of four years. This is going to cover the three main lawsuits, right? The, the, the lawsuits that we all have heard about, right? And any of the copycat seller lawsuits but it doesn't cover anything that may be a buyer plaintiff lawsuit. So if there's any future um, lawsuits that come out of a buyer side transaction that they're suing on those, this is not covering that. That does not exempt them from that, okay? The settlement is also going to cover over a million NAR members. So you're not, anybody who really is a member of NAR with this settlement, and as long as you're not a member of, Home, service, home Buyer Services of America, which is Berkshire Hathaway, because they haven't settled the case yet. This will cover everybody other than them. So you're an NAR member, you're covered now. You, you can't be sued for the same thing, okay? You personally. And the practices right now, the change to the practices should, is they think, will go into effect mid-July this year, okay? So let's look at how we've done things presently right so buyer broker compensation is displayed in the mls and it's by it was a binding offer it couldn't be changed right so you guys know that right now in our mls as it works you're not required to put compensation anymore in there but if you do put compensation that you're offering compensation from the listing broker to the buyer's broker that's binding meaning once i put it in i'm required to pay that compensation now I can make changes to that compensation, but if somebody has submitted an offer prior to that change, I'm still required to pay that compensation. So for example, if I mistakenly put my listing in at 3% and it took me four or five days to realize it, and I receive an offer before I change it to the two or two and a half that I wanted to offer or that my seller and I had agreed to offer, that offer that I received before I made the change, I'm still liable, required to pay them 3%. 
okay so that's how the mls works right now that once there is an offer of compensation it can't be revoked right so that's one of the things that's going to be changing it was one of the things that was part of the lawsuit and then for you guys to understand really how the lawsuit started or where it stemmed from was sellers believed that nar and the other brokerages that were the other corporations that were included in the lawsuit were artificially keeping listing agent and buyer agent commissions elevated right they were artificially keeping them at that five or six percent mark that they weren't moving because there was the mandatory compensation piece so that was part of their lawsuit they alleged that because nar made it mandatory previously that there had to be compensation now that changed recently but previously not only did you have to pay whatever compensation you put in but you had to put some kind of compensation into the mls there had to be compensation there wasn't anything that could be zero that's changed now you can't put zero but right now if i do choose to offer any kind of compensation to a buyer's broker i'm required to do that so that was part of the lawsuit was hey you're you know you guys are artificially inflating these commissions which means it's costing us more money because you're forcing us to pay buyers agents okay to work with a buyer now currently and in the past the only thing you've needed to work with a buyer is for the buyer to sign a disclosure regarding agency relationships that was it you didn't you weren't required to have a buyer representation agreement or now the new form, the buyer representation and broker compensation agreement, you weren't required to have any of that. If I had a buyer sign a disclosure regarding agency relationships, that was enough for me to be their agent, to have a fiduciary duty to them, okay? So that was one of the things, again, this is something that may is, is going to change as we get closer to this July um, date. Dual agency happens all the time, right? Like, as a matter of fact, that's what you guys all hope for. You're going to take a listing, you're going to find the buyer, and you're going to sell both sides, okay? Super common. With the changes that are going in effect, dual agency might be a choice, right? It might be a different choice that you have to make depending on the amount of time that you want to spend with each one of these buyers. So dual agency, super common. We'll talk about the changes when we get there. And right now, let's be honest, as buyer's agents, we have limited to no consultation with our buyers, you know, in regards to the services that we offer or what we're going to do throughout a transaction prior to taking them out and writing offers and opening transaction. I mean, if we're honest with ourselves, we do know that. We all know we should do buyer consultations, sit down with them, go through the whole process and do all that stuff. A lot of times we don't do that. We get a buyer that calls us, we get them qualified with a lender, they qualify, we're out the door and we're showing them property and we're writing offers. But we don't really, we don't really prior to talk to them about what it is that we do, you know, how our compensation works and the process of selling a home. We don't do that consultation piece and that's the norm now. So it's something else that may change, well, that will change now that we're gonna have this settlement and that we're gonna have some changes to our practices come July. So let's look at the updated practice now, right? This is what's gonna be like on the other side of this settlement being approved when we get to July. There will be no longer any offer of buyer broker compensation in the MLS, right? So that section that says compensation will be removed. Not, not just it's okay to offer zero, it's not going to be there any longer. So that section's gonna be gone. So there's no requirement to any, enter any kind of compensation to a buyer's broker. Sellers may still pay commissions to buyer's brokers, but they're going to do it through concessions like they would for a credit for closing costs or a credit for, you know, in lieu of repairs, things like that. They're going to be paying through escrow just like they would do any other concession, but there is no mandatory compensation for them to pay. So they could still pay it. Just it's going to be handled differently, which means what will happen is when we put the listing in the MLS, if we have a seller, if we have a seller that's willing to offer compensation for the buyer's broker in the private remarks, like you would do maybe now saying, hey, the, you know, seller now, you put in the private remarks, seller is willing to credit buyer X amount for buyer's closing costs. Do the same thing in the private remarks. What you do is seller is willing to pay 
you know, 15,000, 10,000, 1%, 2%, whatever of the sales price for compensation to the buyer's broker. And we'll get into some of that verbiage in a moment as we get into further slides, okay? Uh, in the chat, can we add it to the offer? Yep, and we're gonna talk about that too. You absolutely, now compensation is something that can be negotiated in the offer. And as a matter of fact, it's kind of been there already. If you've been through my contract class, if you've been through the RPA classes, there's already a space there. CAR kind of, I think, had some foresight. They've already added in a section in the RPA where a, a buyer's broker or a buyer can request for the seller to pay the compensation of the buyer's broker. So that's already there. So some of you are familiar with it. It's, it was confusing when it first got added, but now it makes sense that it's there. Um, what about the listing agreement? You know, I, I think all the forms, and, and we're gonna get to that too, I think all the forms are probably gonna have to have some changes, obviously, some some fundamental changes on how things are, but yes, you could have a, in the listing agreement where a seller says, hey, I'm agreeing that I'm going to pay X amount of compensation, whether it be you know, the compensation only to the listing broker or what they're planning to offer out. And even if it's not in the listing agreement and you can negotiate that later during the purchase agreements, that's gonna be acceptable too. And uh, what do we got? We have, uh, what happens if the seller says, no, I don't wanna pay the buyer's agent? Then they have no obligation to pay the buyer's agent and any agent that brings a buyer would have to get compensated by their buyer. That's just the change now. So if you do run into a seller that's adamant that they don't want to change, they don't want to pay for a buyer's broker, then you still list the property. You would still get your commission based on what you negotiate with them. Any buyer's agents that brought their own buyers would have to have a buyer's representation agreement and they would get paid compensation from their buyer. Let's move on. <coughs> so just like we talked about a moment ago, they can pay the commission. So even if they put into the MLS the, in the private remarks that they're willing to pay concessions that would compensate the buyer's broker. It has to be included in the contract. It's all subject to the negotiation in the RPA, so it can go back and forth, right? Anything that I put in the, in the purchase agreement as a request can be countered, can be changed. All that stuff is a negotiation. The, the biggest issue that probably people are gonna run into is the buyer agent can't be paid more than the pre-negotiated amount in their buyer representation agreement. So now for me to represent a buyer, right? Because earlier we said, all I needed to represent a buyer now is the disclosure regarding agency relationships. Well, now as a buyer's agent, I am required to prior to showing property, have a buyer representation and broker compensation form completely filled out and agreed to, showing the compensation that the buyer is willing to pay me, okay? Now that's up to you, and we'll talk about that a little bit too, is, is about how you're gonna have to work on your skills. We'll get to that a little bit later. And things that you may have to change and how you have conversations with the buyers to show value, because you're gonna have to negotiate prior to selling a house with the buyer on how much compensation you're gonna get. So if I negotiate with my buyer, my buyer says the most I can pay you is 2% or the most I can pay you is 1%, that's it. That's all I can afford on top of all my other fees, my down payment, my closing costs, everything else, I can only pay you 1%. So we negotiate the 1%. And then going through the service of finding them a property to write an offer on, I find a listing where the seller says, we will pay 2% or 3% of the purchase price and concessions to the buyer's broker, right? To, to pay the compensation of the buyer's broker. That's great. We can write an offer on that property, but I can only still get 1% of the sales price because that's what my agreement was with my buyer. That was my agreement of compensation to work for them. So that's a big change. Um, let's see what we got here. Um, can you add sales price and what would you say in the offer? We're gonna get to that in a little bit. Um, if commission is paid through concessions, will it interfere with seller paying buyer's closing costs on the loan side? I believe if FHA allows up to 6%. It could, depending on how you structure the concessions, right? Because if we do it as seller to credit buyer X amount of money to pay the compensation, then absolutely. We think, and again, like this stuff is fluid, and from all the investigation I've done and reading and, and looking through the 
and looking through the, the settlement agreement itself, there's a possibility that there could just be a statement in the, in the counteroffer contract that says seller to credit directly to buyer's broker X amount for a compensation. So, you know, again, still kind of fluid, but we think, and I'm going to get to that verbiage in a moment. Um, and yes, it, it, this is probably going to have a, a bigger impact on FHA and VA clients uh, on the amount of credits that they can get if we're going to work it like that. Um, okay, so you can't get paid, Mr. Whatever I negotiate, that's what I'm going to get paid. Okay, so keep in mind, now I can always get paid less, right? If I negotiate with my buyer, say that they, can, they agree to pay me 3% if I don't get compensation from the seller or the listing broker they can pay me the 3%, right? They say, okay, we're good with that. We're fine. We understand. And then the seller goes to say, hey, we're only going to pay 1% or 2% of the purchase price as a concession. Technically, the buyer would still owe me the 1% difference, but I think that we can work into our buyer representation agreement so it doesn't seem, as, it doesn't seem punitive to the buyers that their, their obligation to pay will be you know, will be uh, uh, removed if receiving any compensation from an outside source. You know, like we could kind of, we could probably verbally work that into a representation agreement so that you can assure them that if you do receive compensation from any outside source, that you're not going to be requesting compensation from them on top of it. Can the buyer representation agreement be rewritten with the consent of the buyer? Uh, I mean, it's a contract. So if you and the and the and the buyer agree to a different contract, just like if you were with a listing agreement, if I mean, the if I take a listing agreement today, and that, and the, what we have to think about this is this is just now like a listing agreement for a buyer, and this is something I've told you guys for years when we've talked about buyer representation agreements. It's just not something that was mandatory, so we didn't use it. We were afraid of using it. Now it's mandatory, but just like a listing agreement. If we need to renegotiate the terms of a listing agreement, we could do that during the term of the listing agreement. And there's a form for that. And as a matter of fact, it even includes this form. It's called the modification of listing agreement, buyer representation, or other agreement. So it includes the buyer representation agreement. There's modification form for those. So if there is some changes that need to be made, you can make those changes. You don't have to redraft a new um, agreement, okay? So just know that now any buyer, well, not now, come July, but maybe, maybe this is something I wanna start putting into practice now so that I can really get comfortable with it and the process of using that so that we have, you know, we don't feel so fearful of it come July. If we just start maybe putting some of these things into practice now and getting ready for it and, and being prepared for it, I think what will happen too is after July comes, you know, comes and goes and the changes go into effect. And, you know, I know that all of us fear change, especially real estate professionals. We fear change more than most, I believe. Um, but I think that what happens is just like when anything changes in our market, you know, 12, 18, 24 months later, we've now come to some kind of some kind of, uh, you know, uh, best practices in the market, like the market kind of determines this is how things get handled and everybody just falls into that. And I think we'll get to that also. Uh, can you get compensated by both seller and buyer if both agree? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's what I was just mentioning to you in the past was uh, previously on the thing. If, if I have a buyer representation agreement from my seller, from my buyer that says they're going to pay me 3% and the seller pays me only 1% or 2%, then the buyer pays me the 1% extra, you know, the 1% difference on what they had already agreed to. Now you can't do, I'm getting 3% from the seller and 3% from the buyer. That doesn't work. You can't do that. The most you can get is the amount that's in your buyer representation agreement. Um, let's see what we got here. Um, can you get to a second? Yeah. That's what we just talked about. Kyle, can we put in the buyer representation example, commission to be 3% to selling office, 1% from buyer and 2% to be negotiated with the seller, depending on how much the buyer can pay. Um, okay. Yeah, I mean, you, 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 you could, I think you could do it that way. I, I think that, um, yeah, you could, you could do it that way, but I, I think that um, you probably got to be a little careful about the math like that. I don't know. But again, like I said, things are fluid. We've got time to try to figure out exactly how we're going to hit that. 
Um, but it's, I think that's plausible. And let me see, will we need to submit the buyer representation agreement to escrow? Yes, you will, absolutely. And you'll have to submit it with your offers. Because if, especially if you're asking for compensation, you're asking for compensation to set off the compensation that was being paid by your buyer. So it is going to have to go with your offers. And these things, these, th this SPBB and the buyer representation agreement, this Thursday in contract class, I'm not going to go over it because I want to finish the RPA. But next Thursday, we're going to dig into that buyer representation and broker compensation again. And the SPBB, which is the seller's payment of buyer broker compensation. Okay. Um, so in reality, we can get 3% from buyer. No, 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 I think somebody's misunderstanding. No, you can only get 3% maximum or whatever you've negotiated. If you have a buyer representation agreement that they've agreed to pay you 6% commission, which, come on guys, let's be realistic. First of all, that's taking advantage. And, and secondly, there, I don't think there's a buyer that has 6% cash to be able to give to you. And the lender's probably not gonna allow that much of a payment. So you're either gonna get the 3% you've negotiated from the buyer, you're gonna get all 3% from the seller if you negotiate that, or you're gonna get a portion from the seller and a portion from the buyer if you want that. Now, okay, so if you're talking about double ending, meaning I have the listing and a buyer comes to me, yes, I could do that if the seller is paying it or if the seller pays me 3% and the buyer pays me 3%. Yes, if I'm the listing agent, yes, I could do that. Yes, sorry. I was looking at this solely from a buyer's perspective. So yes, if you're the listing agent, yes, technically you could get that. Okay, let's keep moving on here and I'll come back to uh, any questions. Okay, all right. You've got to, like I just said, we've got to negotiate your fee and your services prior to showing. Okay. And that was one of the reasons that I mentioned the double, the dual agency. Okay. So I've got to buyer broker and I've got to negotiate that buyer broker representation prior to showing properties. Okay. It's not this, it's not like it was before. Or won't be like it has been now or was before. There is no requirement of unconditional compensation to buyer broker, meaning like that's it. Like there's nothing that says the buyer's agent has to get paid by the seller or the listing agent. Okay. So let's look at, we talked about verbiage, right? The seller can pay commission via concessions. So you got to ask for it in the, for the concessions in the contract though. So you could do possible verbiage. Like I said, this is possible. I'm just kind of brainstorming this off of what I've read. Seller to credit buyer blank amount at close of escrow to satisfy buyer's contractual obligation to compensate buyer's broker. Now that's a credit. That's a credit to the buyer so that we know that that can happen. But if there's any other credits, if there's, if they need closing cost credit or credit for repairs, remember those credits are going to get reduced. So whatever happens, whatever amount of credit that the, that the buyer, the seller can pay has to go through closing costs repairs, well, closing costs and your commission. So your commission could get reduced based on the amount of that credit. So keep in mind, if we write it this way, it's a credit and the lender can reduce that amount that they'll allow. Or, and this is again, this is an or, I, I'm not 100% sure yet that this is gonna work, but it's it seems like it shouldn't be an issue. Seller agrees to pay through escrow, either a dollar amount or a percent of sales price to buyer's broker and I should have probably put on there to satisfy buyer's compensation, you know, buyer's uh, um, agreement to compensate, right? Like we'll put that in there and I, and I can fix that as we get closer. But just something like that, that looks like it's not a credit to the buyer, it is a cost to the seller, just like anything else. Like think about like they're paying for termite repair. We've submitted this cost, they've agreed to pay for it. Okay, let me go back to chat here real quick. Um, so there's like, I mean, there's not really a cap. The cap is for a buyer's agent. The cap is whatever you negotiate with your buyer prior to showing for the listing agent. The cap is whatever you negotiate with your, with your seller that they're willing to pay compensation to the listing agent and to the buyer's agent. Um, let's see here. The buyer presentation will be treated the same way as the listing presentation, right? Uh, basically, yes, it has a begin date and end date. It has the compensation that's being paid. It has the, you know, the duties of both party, the buyer and the seller. So it's, yeah, it's basically a listing agreement for buyer. 
Okay, let's see, Carmen. Let's say I have a listing and a buyer doesn't have a buyer's agreement with another agent. Do they need to sign a buyer agreement with me? For some reason, that purchase doesn't follow, follow through. Is that buyer tied to me or does that agreement cancel? Okay, so again, let's. this is what I was talking about with dual agency. So now we've got as listing agents, as this change comes through, we've got to make a decision on how you want to handle those sign calls and those you know, walk in people that don't have agents. So there's two ways to fill out the buyer representation agreement. One is specifically to that property, which means that for that property, your listing that was the sign call or the walk in, they are tied to you and tied to you only. If they write an offer with another agent, they owe the compensation to you. You've got a buyer representation agreement on that property. Or I can fill it out in a more general sense, which is the average sales prices that they're looking at, the communities, the size of the house, the, the amenities, that kind of stuff. And if I do it that way, then they're forever tied to me for anything. Now, I also have to also do my job. I have to show them properties. I can't just say, well, it was only on this one. Now you're tied to me. If you want to write anything else, you got to call me. It doesn't work like that anymore, guys. It's like we're going to have to actually work for the buyers. Uh, to show that there's compensation due to us. So yeah, it, look, think about it this way. For you guys now, today, if you have a listing right now, if a buyer calls you right now and says, I want you to write an offer, I have all cash, whatever the case is, they email you and show you proof of their funds, all that stuff. I know that you guys have done it before. You've written that offer without meeting the people and sent it to them and, and submitted it. Some people have done that. We can't do that anymore. Now, prior to writing that offer, you got to sit down with them. You got to take them and have you got to have them sign that buyer representation agreement. You've got to explain to them why they're going to owe you compensation if the seller doesn't pay it. Think about this as listing agent, right? So if I'm the listing agent and I try to I negotiate with my seller to say, hey, listen, we've got to offer some kind of compensation. And we're going to talk about this a little bit more later. I, we have to offer, offer some kind of compensation to really sell your house. So in the MLS, what we're going to do is we're going to put in that you're going to pay concessions of X amount. And then you get the buyer as the listing agent, right? And you sign the buyer representation agreement. You submit the offer and, you're, and your seller says, you know what? I don't want to pay you two commissions. I don't want to pay you two commissions. You're getting already, you already had the listing side. You said we were paying the second commission to, to generate buyers, but you don't, you didn't need that because you already knew the house existed. I don't want to pay it. They probably don't have to pay you guys, which means again, you're going to have to go back to the buyer's agent, to the buyer and say, buyer, you owe me compensation for this because you signed the buyer representation agreement. So, Again, things are gonna be fluid. It's gonna take us a while to kind of figure out best practices, but the agreement doesn't cancel unless it's only on that specific property. If it's, if it's just more of a, a general area, then you're gonna still have that representation, okay? Um, if we use the seller's payment to buyer's broker form, would we have to add that verbiage to the RPA? Well, it's already in the RPA, so that, if you're checking a box on the RPA, so that form SPBB is is added to already. So right now it would be that way, the SPBB. But I don't know how the forms are going to change because that SPBB has some different verbiage in it that has to do with the MLS and the mandatory payments. So that may change. So I don't want to just rely on the SPB. That's why we're looking at what can we write into our purchase agreement to make sure that we're covered until we know exactly what the forms are going to look like. And I'm sure prior to the July date, when we get some kind of confirmation that this is going to go through, we're going to get some changes in our CAR documents and we'll go over those. If we submit a CBC with the offer, wouldn't that satisfy most of the issues or will that be removed? The CBC has gone. There is no cooperating broker compensation anymore. So I would imagine that the CBC is going to be gone in July when these changes take place. Will we be able to add it on top of the purchase price? Sure. Just like anything else, right? Like, like any other concession. So for example, if the seller, you know, we've done it in the past, right? Buyers need closing costs. So sales price is 700. We offer them 715 and ask for $15,000 in closing costs. Same thing. Hey, listen, you were selling for 700. We're going to offer you 715, but 15,000 is going to be paid as compensation to the buyer's broker to, you know, uh, to, to, um, my mind just went blank for the word I was looking for. 
to resolve the obligation of the buyer to pay the compensation, right? So you could do that, sure, absolutely. Just like any other concession. Can we do it via Zoom too? Oh, you're talking about have a Zoom appointment with your buyer to have them sign? Yeah, absolutely, sure you could, sure you could. I, I, what I mean in person is you, you've gotta have some kind of conversation with them about the services that you provide to, get, to have them sign that. But sure, you could do it over Zoom. Um, let's see, this is why we have to be careful with what we say to buyers and not let them know if the seller is paying to selling agent for walk-ins. Uh, I don't know if I understand that, but no, this is the exact opposite, why we've got to be clear and clarity and, and, and transparency is what this was about, supposedly, besides the money. Let's see, if we take a listing at 6%, then a buyer's agent brings in an offer with the buyer paying their commission, the listing agent gets 6%. Okay, so I don't know what the new listing contract is gonna look like, because there are gonna be changes to the listing contract. But my assumption would be that it will read something like total compensation paid to be 6% of that 6%, just like it does now, this amount of money is going to be paid via concession to the buyer's agent. Or it'll be listing agent only compensation will be X. And then there'll be concessions for what they're going to offer out. It's not like you're going to get, oh, it's 6%. Like, it's not going to be our listing contract today where you put a total of 6% and if you double end it, you get six or no matter who buys it, you get six. If they don't, there's another age, you get, you know what I mean? Like it's not going to be that anymore. So you, it, 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 things are going to change contractually that are going to also mirror the stuff that we're talking about here today. So you can't think of it in terms of what our listing agreement looks like and is like today, because it will be different in July. That's why we're talking about these change in practices. Will this affect appraisals? Um, I mean, I don't know that it will unless we're writing super over asking price offers to get the commission paid, just like we would with with concessions today. That that can be affect the you know that can affect the concessions because of the appraisal. Okay. Uh, do you foresee any are raising our fees to pay the 400 million settlement? Can we opt out of here? Okay, so as of what I understand from, this is about opting out of NAR. From what I understand now, based on that, I don't think that it is mandatory for you to be a member of NAR, but don't quote me on that. Um, let's see, they had, okay, so now they're just having a, a, a little, conversation about the amount of money that NAR makes. So we'll skip that for now. Okay, next slide. What can you do now? Working with sellers. This is the stuff that you're gonna start doing to prime your sellers for what's coming, right? Get you ready for how you're presenting to sellers. You're gonna have to take a look at your listing presentation and what are you explaining to sellers to take them beyond the headlines, right? Because they're hearing the same talking head, doom and gloom stuff that you guys are hearing that, you know, I'm, I've already heard, I'm not paying. I had somebody just said right now, came and told me that now after my my agent, uh, after a, a, a potential seller said, after I saw this with NAR, I'm not paying any commissions. Now you can, you can represent me and if you bring the buyer, then I'll pay you, right? So you're gonna get stuff like that. You've gotta be prepared for the kind of arguments that are gonna come and you've gotta have information as to why there are certain things that we have to do, right? So you gotta explain to them how does the compensation to a buyer broker work? Like how does the whole thing work? And especially as we move into the new era of buyer compensation, how does that work? How does it work today? Because I don't think enough of us explained it properly and that's probably why we got into the situation we're into now is because listing agents weren't really having the right conversation with their sellers about how buyer's compensation worked, okay? concessions are now you got to start putting in into your conversations with listing with, on your listing appointments and pricing start talking about concessions today and i don't just mean commission concessions i'm talking about get them prepared for the idea that there you know some buyers are going to need some help and we're seeing already an increase i think in, in the in the mls it's like 50 percent of the deals that closed um last year had some kind of concession involved so We've got to start preparing our buyers, our sellers in that pricing conversation already. Have that conversation with them. And then also talk to them about who is the buyer for their properties, an FHA or a VA buyer, because 
that buyer, if they have represent, representation, is likely going to be asking for the representation, the compensation to be paid by the seller. VA buyers aren't going to be able to pay it. They can't. They're not allowed to. And FHA buyers have very limited funds. So you've got to have that conversation with your potential sellers that if they're in one of those sales prices or areas that are predominantly FHA sellers, right? That the buyer, the predominant buyer for your home is going to be an FHA or a VA borrower. You've got to talk to them about including into that compensation piece as part of the process to get their home sold because of who their actual, you know, buyer is. And then are you the listing agent talking about you? Are you going to offer showings to any buyer? Or are you going to be referring? sign calls, right? Because we just talked about everything you have to go through with sign calls and how you're going to get paid or not paid. Do you want to take on that liability and maybe only make listing side compensation because your seller doesn't have an obligation to pay you two commissions just because you bring on the buyer? Or do you want to refer those buyers out and say, hey, listen, if a buyer has to pay compensation, let a buyer's agent negotiate that. Okay. So that's something that you've also got to start taking into account is how are you going to handle those sign calls? What are you going to do with them? What's going to be your process for the consultation and the negotiation of getting a buyer to sign that compensation agreement because they may have to pay your compensation. Uh, let's see, we got another chat here regarding buyer concessions. Do you anticipate lenders will start to allow higher concession amounts when part of the buyer concessions is to pay compensate the buyer agent? Uh, I was going to mention that a little bit, but yeah, I think that probably there'll be some changes. I don't know how long that'll take, but you know, lenders are, besides rates, are pretty good at how they kind of, you know, they're they're fluid to continue to to be current in how the market works, right? They come up with new programs and do things. So I think we might start to see some either different programs or some loosening of the credits to allow for them. Start to update your listing presentation and address the menu of services you provide and the fee for those services. And what I mean for that is this. We're so worried about sellers being able to wanting to pay commission, not want to pay commission. And I think, again, opinion, I know we're going to go through some growing pains with it. And there's going to be a lot of sellers that are going to say, nah, forget it. I heard I don't have to pay anything. I'm not paying it. And there's going to be those people. But there's still today are people that have to sell their house that are reasonable business people or not reasonable in the idea that we know we need to sell our house because we have to accomplish something. And the sooner we sell it, the better. And yes, we'd like to sell it for the most money possible, but we also don't want to be on the market for 90 or 120 days. And so I think as we move forward with our listing presentations, that maybe what we want to look at is some options for sellers to say, okay, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, you don't want to pay any compensation. Okay, so that would be our option three in the package of our listing packages. And what that means is that we've got to list your property at 5% or so below market value because any buyer that comes in is going to have to pay their buyer agent a compensation. And so the money that they are going to pay out, they're going to assume they're saving on the sale of your house because you're not paying compensation. And we probably got to assume that we're going to be on the market probably twice as long as the average market dates because we're not... Uh, we're not incentivizing any buyer's agents to come in, right? Or you could say, or we could pay this limited amount of, like this is, that's our nose, that's our, like, our, 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 our base service. Our second level of service is we offer this much compensation and this is what we think the pricing would look like on that in the sales price. These are, again, these are just opinions. Or you pay a full, a full commission for a full service listing agreement and this is the things that we do and what we offer and what we think it will what we think it will accomplish for you. And somebody put in motivation is key in the chat and it's 100% true because the people who are motivated need to sell have a reason, have something that they need to do. They need to sell their house for a reason, right? And what is it, it's the, it's the you know, death, divorce and, and kids, right? Those are the things that always you know, put people in a position where they have to sell those people are probably going to be willing to listen. The people that have a need are going to be willing to listen to a professional agent that is able to share value with them to say, this is the reason why we need to offer compensation to buyers brokers. So a lot of this stuff, a lot of what we're worried about as a buyer's agent is going to fall on the heads of listing agents. So my suggestion to you buyer agents, the people that are buyer heavy, start working on becoming a listing agent hard now. 
because you're ultimately going to be the one that's going to determine how much difficulty a buyer's agent has to get compensated in this market, really, to be honest. Now, as a buyer's agent, you got to look at what your buyer consultation consists of. What is it? Is it just, oh, yeah, I'll show you because you got qualified? It's not that anymore. You got to have a strategy for how to win the buyer. Show them your value. What are you going to do to separate you from another agent? Because they're paying everybody now. The chances are that that buyer has to pay somebody to have that representation. Right? So what are you doing to show your value as a buyer's agent? What is it that you do that's different than the other buyer's agent? Because that guy across the street's only going to charge me 500 bucks to open the door and write a contract for me. What are you going to do that's going to charge me 2 or 3%? You've got to have those things down. Who are you as a buyer's agent? Are you clear on the services you provide? Is it apparent on your website and social media? Explain the process to your buyers. What's changing and how you're going to take care of them moving forward? Because you guys have buyers right now that, you may, that you're working with today that you may not get into escrow prior to changes. Or you're working with leads right now that are in that position where they're kind of in that summer move mode that you're probably going to have to start working with them after these changes go into effect. Start preparing people today that are buyers. Start preparing them today. And maybe, just maybe, some of those buyers you have that have been sitting on the fence are going to get off the fence right now before July comes and there's a chance that they have to pay some compensation. So if I were you as a buyer's agent, I'd be on the phone with every lead I have right now. Update your resume and statistics with key terms. And this is something I thought was, was good. That's why I wanted to add it. How many contracts have you written and got accepted the first time you wrote it, right? Like how many times have you taken a buyer out, wrote an offer for him, got him accepted? What's your, what's your average on that? Because that's going to be something that people are going to be like, wow, I want to work with them. If they can get their offers accepted that fast, then that's the kind of guy I need working for me or gal I need working for me, right? Average number of homes shown to find the one, right? Like what's your time period from the day we start working together till the day I get you an escrow and closed in your home? How much time do we spend together? Just like Right When I talk to you guys about statistics, when we're talking about the statistics and I'm telling you about listing performance, right? I talk about average days on market, how fast we sell, how much faster than our competition we sell. I talk about our list price versus sales price. How much more do we sell our homes for and compared to our, our competition, okay? These are the kind of things that are gonna have to happen now for you as a buyer's agent. One of those is, how, what's your closing time average and how much have you saved your clients? So all those people that are, go out there and say, hey, sold $50,000 over asking. Now you're going to start to see those buyer's agents that are trying to get those buyers that are willing to pay them and, and are good buyers. They're going to be like, hey, I got this one accepted at fifteen dollars or $20,000 less than asking price. That's you're going to start to see some changes. How this affects home prices, I don't know yet. It's all going to depend on what happens with the motivation of buyers to pay compensation or the motivation of sellers to pay compensation to see if it removes any buyers from the market. Because if we start to remove buyers from the market and, and, and the demand for supply reduces and supply increases, then we see a difference in prices. But if the supply never increases to outmatch demand, prices are probably not gonna go down by much, right? So don't start looking at prices as an issue more than just how do we maneuver this. So these are the things to watch for, right? Updates to the zip forms, like I talked about. So just keep an eye on whenever there's an update to your zip forms, just make sure you're checking and looking for those updates. Look for those emails from CAR. Right, the emails from CAR and from the board, you guys, I know that a lot of times you ignore those. Pay attention to those now going forward because CAR and the board are probably gonna be better sources of information than me because that's where I'm gonna get it from. So if you're waiting for me to share it with you, you guys just pay attention to that communication from those people, from the boards and from CAR. Updates to the MLS rules and forms, that's coming. It's gonna have to happen, right? Potential changes for FHA and VA borrowers. Because right now, the way it works for, for, for VA borrowers, they're not going to be able to pay. So I don't know how easy it will be for the Veterans Administration and the government to change the structure of their Veteran Administration loans. But you probably, when veterans don't have the ability to purchase their homes, you'll probably see some changes in those. And same with FHA and just like people had asked in the chat. Okay, So that's the stuff that we want to look for. 
that's what I wanted to share with you guys. So now, questions. If you have a question, raise your hand and I'll unmute you. So I gave us a little bit of time for some questions. Anybody? Either I was crystal clear or I scared the hell out of you so much that you guys are petrified. Look, here, here's the thing. This is what I wanted to do with this. I just wanted you guys to be aware of what it really means. Because I don't think I, I don't think that a lot of the social media stuff that's out there, it's you know, it's it's like the news, right? They have to sensationalize it. They want to get you to click. They're 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 looking for that stuff. It has to be exciting. It has to be exciting. It has to be, um, you know, eye catching to get you and, and, and digging into the into the minutia of it and, and what the changes are going to be for you and, and maybe what it looks like for you guys to now start taking action today to prepare yourselves. That's not the stuff they're going to talk about on social media. Um, OK, so Zuli raised her hand first. So let me get up there. Um, go ahead, Zuli. Hello, Kyle. Hi, Zuli. Hi. Do you think this will slow the market a little bit more? Um, I think it will kind of like how the interest rates did at the end of last year. You know, like um, when the interest rates got up to the 8% for a while and it, and it like buyers went, whoa, I think there's going to be a little bit of that with this is that buyers are going to be like, oh, forget it. I can't pay it until we start getting into the practice where buyers agents, you know, are starting to communicate like this is how it's really working. I think it'll start to bring the buyers back in just as the interest rates started to drop back, you know, down towards six. I think probably initially you're going to see some buyers kind of putting the brakes on, I think. Uh, go ahead, Jesus. Yes, uh, definitely. I cannot stress enough. Uh, working with if you're work if you're working with buyers right now, take advantage of the yeah. the seller still paying for it and, and and open escrow with them. I just came back from Lancaster. The buyers were on the fence. I told them if you wait a little longer, it's gonna take you. It's gonna cost you six thousand dollars more to buy this condo. So they are submitted an offer. Yeah. So definitely, yeah, this can change. I, I mean, it, I mean. You're still going to be able to work with buyers after this change happens, and and you will, and you guys will see. And as we get through it, you'll start to see that there's still opportunities for you as buyers agents, and there's going to be stuff that's going to be like not what we expect, but it's going to work for everybody. But you do have a very compelling message for your buyers today to get busy with them, right? To get them off the fence if they are at all. I think that that's gotta be, your qualified buyers that are ready to go, you've gotta be on the phone with them immediately and trying to set appointments to get them into escrow, okay? Um, Carmen, go ahead. You're still muted, Carmen. All right, let me jump to Carlos. Go ahead, Carlos. Oh, so Carmen. Guess, okay. Oh, okay, Carlos ahead, first, Carmen. then we'll go back to Carmen. Go ahead, Carlos. Okay. Now, well, I guess I'm referring, I was asking about the appraisal because I believe you stated you could ask for the your commission or your the buyer's fee as a concession, correct? Yeah. Yeah, so if we're asked, if we already, you know, come in and asking for a concession on request for repairs and, um, you know, and it just what well, I figure. You know, we, let's say we ask for I don't know ten thousand dollars in request for repairs or five thousand dollars in request for repairs, and then on top of it, we're still asking for a commission. Oh yeah, and, wait, oh yeah, yeah, wait, wait, wait. You're not going to be able to do that. It's going to be your buyers are going to have to make a choice on whether they're going to pay for their closing costs or pay a commission. And if they can't pay a commission, then you're not going to be able to represent them unless they're willing to pay you. The thing is, is that yes, with concessions, there's going to be issues. The lenders are going to limit the amount of credits, just like any other credit. So in the, in the, in the scenario that you're talking about, I write an offer and ask for a closing cost credit of $5,000 and now I need another $5,000 in repairs. So I ask for another I, additional $5,000 in closing costs. So now I have 10,000. If the lender says to me, no, I'm sorry, we're only paying $8,000 in closing costs, then they're only getting you know $3,000 towards that repair. It's the same thing. 
you could ask for a closing cost credit or a repair credit, which repairs is closing costs. So we know that that's how it has to be structured. So you get the closing cost credit for the repairs. Let's say it's five thousand dollars, and they're going to pay a credit of so and so ten thousand for your commission. If the bank disallows any part of that, your commission is going to be is going to be diluted first. So yes, but it, that's not a, it's no it's less an appraisal issue than it is. Um, a credit issue with the lender. The appraisal issue would be if we're writing our offers over asking price to get that that money paid. Now, if we structure it where the seller's paying us directly the compensation, not a credit to the buyer and the buyer's paying us, then we could probably get around those seller issues. It would just it would just be an appraisal issue if we're going above asking price. That that would be it. And again, things are going to change as we get closer to July. So some of the stuff that we're talking about may change. Uh, Carmen, go ahead now. Let me ask you to unmute. Go ahead. Okay, right, question. So let's say we have a, a buyer. We signed an uh, agreement for 3%. They tell me, hey, just show me properties where the seller is paying the compensation. So that's the only property that I want to look at. And then they fall in love with the house that, of course, the seller is not paying a compensation. So mm -hmm. they end up having, uh, so I tried to negotiate for the seller to pay through the closing costs, concessions, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and I get them $5,000. But we mm -hmm. negotiated 3%. So now, do I renegotiate with the buyer? Like, if I really want to make it work, is that going to be allowed once we're already in escrow? Yeah, you mean to reduce the amount of compensation? You're talking about, like, yeah. so you, you don't want to charge your buyer the 3%. Yeah, of course, you can always reduce it. You can always reduce it. Yes. Okay, like, okay. like, you know what? It's funny. I was like, you know, talking about social media last night, I saw an, an agent did a little like a, a skit basically that he was talking about his idea of what, how he's going to deal with his buyers. And he did a little role playing where his buyer said, Hey, I found this house. They're not paying any compensation. I don't have the money to pay you, but I really like the house. And he said, then you go try to get the house on your own. I'm going to step out. I'll cancel our agreement. I'm okay with that. I don't want to stop you from getting a house because you can't pay me. And, 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 and I mean, that might be business decisions that ultimately you guys make. I'm not saying that you have to do that. I'm just saying that that was something that he presented. Whereas, hey, I'm not going to stop a buyer from being able to own a home, but I want to get some kind of compensation. So the alternative is instead of that, say, okay, let's negotiate something out. I, I'm getting $5,000 from the seller. Maybe you could pay me another 1000 or two or whatever. It doesn't have to be a percentage. Of course, you can renegotiate that. Absolutely. Uh, Lulu, go ahead. Can you hear me? Hi. Yeah, yeah, I can hear you now. So, okay, I have like two questions. First okay. of all, if you take a listing, you're going to have to disclose whether the seller's paying compensation or not, right? That's mandatory or not? Uh, well, I, no. There's nothing that says that they have to pay any compensation, so you don't have to disclose anything. If you want buyer's agents to know that the seller is going to pay some compensation, then you would put it in your private remarks when the change happens. So, right now, you would still put it in compensation. So in other words, as a buyer's agent, just to make sure it's better to call the listing agent and double check before yep. you even show up. Call the agent ahead of time. And, 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 and everybody is different. For example, let's say that um, you know I'm the listing agent and I know Jorge has his hand up, that's why I'm using his name. But Jorge and I had a horrible transaction in the past, right? And he submits an offer to me. And Lulu, you and I have had great transactions. Every deal we've done in the past, we've closed early. I could take it back to my seller and go, listen, this guy's requesting compensation, but I've had a terrible time with them. Every transaction we've done has taken extra time. They've not removed contingencies. They haven't done anything. I mean, we could offer to pay them 1% so you'll net more, but we'll have to take the chance that we don't have a good transaction. Or Lulu, who's here, she, she and I have worked together many times. She's fantastic at what she does. I know we're going to get the deal closed. I would feel really comfortable with her as the buyer's agent. I know you're willing to pay compensation. So she's, she's asking for 2.5%, which is slightly more than, than Jorge, but I would prefer to work with Lulu. And that's perfectly okay that I could pay 25 to Lulu and play 1 to Jorge. That's negotiated in the contract now. That's going to be the changes. So again, your relationships that you guys have with listing agents and the, and the reputation that you've got in the past is going to come back, especially this, when you start to write offers saying, hey, I need 3%. They're going to be like, oh, yeah, I remember what you did. Right? Those yeah. things could happen. Those things could happen. But yes, 
you need to reach out to the listing agent on all of these and say, hey, is your seller willing to pay compensation? And if your buyer is adamant that they, that they see that property, you could say, well, you've got, if I show it to you, you got to pay me. So if you don't want to mm -hmm. pay me, then I'm sorry, you're going to have to go on your own, right? Okay. So those are kind of the things that are going to happen if you can't get payment from the seller. So I hope that was clear. Mm -hmm. um, oops, sorry. Uh, go ahead, Jorge. You have to unmute. There you go. Um, I'll, I'll, I guess going off one of the examples that someone asked about, hey, you know, uh, they can't pay you, um, but they signed a contract originally with you. And, you know, as an agent, we have the freedom of, let's say, releasing them of that agreement. My question is, do we have, can we incorporate, okay, we're going to be working together. This is my hourly pay in the event that we each go our separate way. You know, this will be the hourly pay that you owe me in order for me to release you. Should you want to go and write an offer, you know, on a property that isn't going to be paying compensation? Ah, uh, that's a tough one. I mean, I think what you could say is if, you know, if we agree to cancel this agreement, buyer agrees to pay X amount, not based on my hourly rate, but based on just that this is the cancellation charge of the agreement, right? Because it's just like a listing. Just like any listing, I, I, the listing, I have the right, if I cancel your listing, I have the right to charge you for that cancellation as of now, as of today. I don't know how that's going to change, you know, with the new compensation rules. But I think maybe you could build something in there. It would be hard to say that, hey, I work for you X amount of hours and this is what you owe me. I think it would be probably easier if you worked in some kind of a cancellation fee that said, you know, hey, if you cancel this agreement prior to the expiration of the agreement or close of escrow, this is the amount that, you know, you would pay for cancellation. I'm assuming, I don't know how things are going to change as the compensation changes, but today you could do something like that. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's see. It's me, Jorge and Bricia. Go ahead. You had a question. Okay, so what about in the situation where the buyer goes to me and he signs a contract or buyer's contract and then mm -hmm. he goes back to another open house and he just wants to sign with that agent? What, that de it, depends, that? it depends on how your buyer representation agreement is filled out. If it's filled out as proper as possible, then maybe there's some you know teeth there to fight and say, hey, no, no, I represent them. They're, they owe me money. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But again, it's it's up to you how you want to litigate that if they breach that contract. Got it. Thank okay. you. All right. So real quick, let me go through the chat real quick just to make sure, and then and then we'll finish up because it's already three o'clock. Uh, let me see. There's uh, opportunity everywhere. So a buyer's agent really showing property by faith. No, you're you're not showing by faith. I mean, you've got an agreement from a buyer that says, "Hey, I'm I'm gonna get. I I owe you the money." What we're going to try to do is we're going to try to relieve them from having to pay that by getting the seller to pay it or try to negotiate that. Okay. Um, let's see. Anything else am I missing here? What happens if I get a signed contract with a buyer, but the buyer says, I can't pay you commission. Just show me homes that pay you commission. Is that legal? So somebody, we already talked about that. I mean, yes, it is. If they say, look, because I can't pay you, please only show me stuff that I can, that you can get paid. Sure, you, you you that's an instruction from your buyer. Absolutely, you could do that. Um, will lenders provide incentives to borrower? Don't know. That could be a change that we see. Um, aside from all the other things, I do see value in the fact that I will now be, it will now be expected and enforced that buyers have a contract for agent compensation rather than showing homes without it. I agree. Um, let's see. Good question. Good question. Joe wanted me to say it's all fake news. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Joe, uh, after we spent all that time. Okay, let's see. Ask, uh, Go ahead, Mia, Monica. You had your hand up. Oh, oh so that's that you're just trolling me now in the class? Okay, um, so this is going to be on YouTube. If you missed any of the beginning of it, I'll upload it to my YouTube. It probably won't be uploaded until tomorrow, um, but it'll be there for you guys to see. If you have any questions, you know I'm here. So you can always come to see me, call me, email me. Uh, I'm, a, I'm available. I'll help you the best I can. I, I presented to you guys the best way I understand that we're going to be able to maneuver through this and, and get ready for what's coming in July. So hopefully this helps. Hopefully I alleviated some fears. I know I may have created some others, but hopefully 
<laughs> alleviated some fears and you guys are prepared um you know to really just put her head down get to work and and not worry about the things that we can't control okay all right thank you guys for being here i really appreciate it and i will talk to you soon mm-hmm.